Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. L. Rushbo, your guiding light here at the EIB Network, Limbaugh Institute for Advanced Conservative Studies. And we welcome back to the program, Senator Marco Rubio of Florida. I think you just hustled uh, to our microphones here from a Senate vote, correct? Yeah, we did. Still voting on the uh, gun legislation. Gun legislation. Senator, let, I know your time is limited here. I know you've got a very busy, busy day. And I let, let, let's get started. I, I must tell you, and I'm... I'm I I just don't understand this, Senator. I don't understand why we're doing something that the Democrats are salivating. I've never agreed with Senator Schumer about anything, and I'm being told that I should on this. I, I'm just having a tough time. I, I look at what happened in, in California after the last amnesty. We lost that state to the Democrats. I'm having trouble seeing how this benefits Republicans. Well, a couple of things. First of all, the, as far as Senator Schumer and others who are on the bill are concerned, I, I think the way to understand it is they've agreed to things that we believe in because they, they want our support. They understand it's important to get something done, primarily because not just in the Senate, but because in the House it's controlled by conservative Republicans. As far as why we're dealing with the issue, let me just begin by saying, Rush, that if we didn't have a single illegal immigrant in the United States, we'd still have to do immigration reform for two reasons. One, because our current legal immigration system is broken. I think Americans support legal immigration. I know you do. Legal immigration is good for America if it's controlled and, and, and structured and via a legal process, of course. And But the problem is the system we have in place right now is broken. For example, it is completely family-based, which means it is only based not on what you can do or what talent you have or what merit you bring or what job you could fill, but rather on whether you know someone who already lives here. That needs to be reformed, and, and actually we do that. The second is because our immigration laws are not enforced. And in particular, we don't have an electronic verification system. So when people are hired, they're basically hired using illegal documents. We don't track uh, people that are overstaying visas. So 40% of our illegal immigrants are people that entered legally and have overstayed. And our border is not secure. And we know that is a national security and sovereignty issue as much as it is an immigration issue. So for those two reasons alone, we, we have to do something. And beyond it, I would just say it's not good for the country to have 11 million people here who we don't know who they are, where they're living, with they're not paying taxes, but they're showing up at emergency rooms or driving up the cost of auto insurance because they don't have driver's licenses and are getting into accidents. They're having children, which are U.S. citizens. So, I mean, it's an issue that needs to be dealt with. And beyond that, it's an issue the Democrats were going to raise anyway. So we might as well have an alternative. And, and that's what we've worked on. And hopefully we can keep it an alternative that, that we can support. I want to stick with the with the politics of this yeah. for, for just a second. Before I heard what you say, I understand, yeah. I'm gonna, I'll, I have some questions for you about that, but the politics of this still fascinate me. Um, if you look at the 2010 election or 2012 election results, the percentage of the electorate was seven that it was Hispanic was seven percent, and we got twenty seven twenty eight percent of that vote. The evangelical vote was about twenty eight percent of the electorate, and we got seventy eight percent of that. The Republican right. Party seems to be saying we need to focus on the Hispanic vote and 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 get rid of the social issues. The social issues are killing us. But the Hispanic vote's not that big a percentage of the vote in order for the party to be totally turning upside down what it believes in. Well, Rush, you make a, an interesting point. I would say two things to that. Number one is um, I agree with you that the evangel it, we can we should continue to be the pro-life and pro-traditional values party, and I believe that, uh, that in fact that will help us among Hispanic voters. So the second point I would make to you is that I understand that some voices in the Republican Party are saying we need to do immigration reform for political reasons. I am not one of them per se. This is not my motivation. If people think that we pass this and tomorrow we go from 28 percent to 38 percent or 48 percent, that's just not accurate. I do think it will help them. I do think it will help us make our argument for limited government uh, because people will now perhaps be willing to listen to us. Right now, the Democrats just distract them. They basically say, well, you can't listen to Republicans on anything because they don't like people like you. It's unfair, but that's how they use this issue. And I'm sure they'll continue to try to use it in that way. But that should not be the reason why we do this. I mean, if we are doing this for political reasons, I think we're, we're going to be disappointed. And it's not my motivation. My motivation is I want to solve this problem for the country. And beyond it, let me say that 
as far as what's happened in California and in other places with regard to the, you know, what's driving population growth in California among Hispanics, as it is around the country, is the birth rate. It's not immigration. And, and, and also to that, I would say that every political movement, conservatism included, depends on the ability to convince people that do not agree with you now to agree with you in the future. And I think we have a very strong argument to make to people that are coming here to improve their lives and want to give their children a better life, that what they came here to get away from was big government, and that, in fact, the only way for that to be possible is to free enterprise and limited government. It's a tough argument. We've got to make it consistently over a significant period of time. But I, I know it's one I've been successful making, and I believe we can be successful making as you, a party. You have been, and your personal story is a profoundly motivational and inspirational one, the one that you tell about your father. But then I, I see polling data again that suggests that 70 percent of the Hispanic population worldwide or in the country believes that government is the primary source of prosperity. I don't therefore understand this contention that Hispanics are conservatives in waiting. Yeah. Well, I don't think uh, – let me say a couple things. First of all, I think the fastest – on the social issues, the fastest growing uh, religious groups in America, some of the fastest growing churches are Christ, uh, Hispanic evangelical churches, and I do think we have an opportunity on the social issues. As far as the issue you explained with the 70 percent of, of Hispanics, and I haven't seen that poll, but I've heard similar numbers in other places, so I understand your point. I'd say that's a growing problem in America in general. I think we have a growing problem in this country that too many people have forgotten what the true sense of prosperity is. That's and true. That, I think that's true across the board. And let me tell you who I blame for that first and foremost. I blame that primarily, quite frankly, on, on, on decisions made by the Republican Party in the past to embrace crony capitalism and corporate welfare as conservatism, when in fact that's not what we're about. We are about upward mobility. We're about the true free enterprise system. We're not about big companies being able to use uh, the, the federal government to create rules and regulations that make it harder on their competitors. And I also think that while we've had multiple candidates in the past that have campaigned as limited government government conservatives, uh, of course, until uh, it's their government program that they're trying to protect or, or what have you. So I don't think necessarily Republicans have always governed as the limited government uh, movement. And the result is you see this kind of confusion in the American electorate about what the source of prosperity is. We've got a better job. We have to do a better job of explaining to all Americans that the free enterprise system is the only way to consistently create the kind of growth and opportunity uh, that America's always been uh, identified with. Let's go to the bill. One of the Last time you were here, you you were uh, very certain. You were you assured everybody that until the border was secure, there would not be legalization pathway to citizenship. Now, people who've seen the bill say that what actually happens is that the legalization does take place and that then there's a commission that has 10 years to figure out border security, which is true. Well, a couple points. First of all, the legalization does not begin automatically. We, do, we don't want to wait on legalizing, and I'll tell you why. And my original position was that, that we wanted to you know, secure the border first and then legalize. The problem is we have people, millions of people here now, by some estimates 10, 11 million. We want to know who they are and freeze the problem in place. I don't want that number to grow. It behooves us to know who they are as soon as possible. So it doesn't get worse. What we do is we say the Department of Homeland Security, and this is, gets tricky, so it's important to follow me on it because it's, uh, i got to explain the path. There's actual multiple triggers here. The Department of Homeland Security has to come up with two plans, one to secure the border and one to build fencing, and it has to be both. And they have to not only come up with the plans, which would be reviewed by both the Border Commission on an advisory role and also the General Accounting Office, which is a nonpartisan, very serious agency of government, to ensure that it achieves the following goal, 100% awareness of the border, 90% apprehension. And they have five years to meet that standard. If in five years the border is not 90% apprehension, 100% awareness, they lose control of the border issue to a commission that is not a Washington commission. It is a commission that will largely be driven by the governors of the border states. And I have full confidence that the governors of these border states, talking about Arizona, uh, Texas, New Mexico, obviously California as well, but it's particularly Arizona and Texas, which are the ones most impacted by it now, uh, these governors will take care of this problem, and 
be given money to be able to take care of it. In addition to that, E-Verify becomes mandatory for every business in America, starting with the business biggest companies, and the entry-exit system becomes mandatory. We will track the entry and the exit of all visitors to the United States at all of our airports and seaports. And all of those things must happen before uh, a single green card is issued uh, to, the, to those that are waiting through the regular RPI status, as we call it, the uh, provisional status that we've created. And uh, so we, these are triggers that really must happen. And, and we're obviously, I think it's a vast improvement over what we have now. We're talking with Senator Marco Rubio. Got to take a brief time out here. I know your your schedule is jam tagged today. If if, any, if you can't make it to the bottom of the half hour, you say so, and it won't be a problem. But I've taken a brief time out now, and we'll be back with Senator Rubio right after this. Senator, I know a lot of Republicans who are. I know that you say political aspects of this are not yours, but so many people are scared to death, Senator, that the Republican Party is committing suicide, that we're going to end up legalizing 9 million automatic Democrat voters. And that's why the Democrats are so adamant, don't understand why the Republicans are so eager to make that happen. We seem to be wanting to reach out to Hispanics. Once we do everything we do to reach out to Hispanics, how can we ever reform welfare? How can we reform anything that that we might want to change if it's the product of reaching out to Hispanic, giving them what we think they want in order to get their votes when they're already going to vote Democrat? Well, a couple things as I would say about that. First of all, I'm not prepared to admit that somehow there's this entire population of people that because of their heritage are not willing to listen to our, our, our pitch on why limited government is better. As I said on the outset, we're this is an argument that right now, unfortunately, I think we are losing in many sectors of our society. We have young people that have somehow grown up, and we can chalk it up to the, what the schools are teaching or what they're seeing in the mass media, but people who, who come grown up to believe that government is the source of prosperity, that the way to grow our economy is for the government to spend more. That's all always been a challenge because it's a lot easier to sell people on a government program than it is to sell them on free enterprise and limited government. Uh, it's easier to promise that that's for sure, but I think the evidence is on our side. Once we explain to people the reality of this, I think we can convince anyone. Certainly, I think we convince a lot of people in America. The, 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 I think the future of conservatism, and in fact, I think the future of America, depends on how effective we are at explaining to as many Americans as possible why the road we are on right now is such an economic disaster. And I just maybe you know I just refuse to accept the notion that somehow we're not going to be able to make that argument successfully to Hispanics. Um, I, I, just, I, I imagine that in places like California and New York, where there's a large segment of Hispanics, I also happen to live in very liberal communities. It will probably be a heavier lift. But in places like Florida and Texas, Virginia, uh, and other places throughout the country where there's a growing Hispanic population not tied to these traditional centers of liberalism, I think we have a very compelling story to tell. The evidence shows that Hispanics are heavily entrepreneurial. And I know this, the more taxes people pay, the more that they own, the more they have at stake in the economy, the more conservative and more limited government they become. And I've seen that with my own eyes. Now, well, I have too, within uh, certain years, certain eras of this country's history, we're not, we're not in an era like that now. We're, we're in an era where seemingly more people are low information than ever before and are more susceptible. Look at, Senator, look at the number of people that are not working. I mean, yep. 90 million people are not working, but they're all eating. They've all got phones. They've all got TV sets and so forth. It, it's, they are being supported. They, they are able to live sufficiently well enough that getting a job is not that important, not nearly as important. It's a cultural thing that's happening here. And now we're going to throw immigration reform in this mix right now. I understand your objectives, and they're really admirable. And I, I, I totally wish you all. Uh, all the luck and all the, the best with it. We need people like you fighting for these kind of things. There's, there's no question. But you said something earlier at the top of the interview that the immigration system's broken. There are 11 million people, whatever. We don't know who they are. and We've got to fix it. Why? What, what is it about right now that says, forget everything else I've asked you. Forget the political ramifications I've asked you about. Why does it need to be fixed right now? Well, f first of all, a couple things. If it was up to me, if I controlled the flow of business in the Senate, we would be focused on tax reform and how to get our economy 
growing again and how to get the debt under control. But the reality is the Democrats were going to raise this issue of immigration. So if they're going to raise an issue and force us to address it, then we have to have an alternative. An alternative Why? Why can't we just people. defeat it? Why do we have to address it? Because they because raise there it. Are legitimate, if they raise the issue of immigration, we can't just vote against it. I think one of the things, unfortunately, that's happened in the past is, for example, Obamacare was raised. There is well, a we did gun problem. control. We just voted down right. gun control. But not, well, we didn't vote. Not only are we voting it down, we've offered very good alternatives. For example, one of the things that was voted down yesterday was an amendment by Senator Cruz and Senator Grassley that actually is meaningful stuff, that focuses on the real problem, which is not guns. The real problem is violence. And we have an alternative that actually focuses, of course, people didn't hear about this because the mainstream media won't report on it, but we actually offer some very good alternatives about increasing prosecutions for criminals that are violating the background check, existing background check laws, you know, how to strengthen our mental health systems, etc. Um, and no one's reporting on that stuff. So it's important to have an alternative. And, and I think, unfortunately, on immigration, if it arises, we need to have an alternative, too, because we do have things that are wrong with, with the immigration system. So well, what about now, enforcing current law as an alternative? Well, I'm, the problem with the current law, and I, I think that's uh, accurate. I mean, people have violated the current law. There's going to be a consequence for that. You know, it, it's a misnomer to believe. Some people believe that if you're illegally in the country now, you can never become a citizen. That's not true. If you're under existing law, if you are illegally here, you can become a citizen. The law says you have to leave the country, and in 10 years, you can get a green card. And once you get a green card, you can become a citizen in three to five years. And all we're saying is, okay, here's the reality. People have screwed up in government. They haven't enforced our laws. So now we have 11 million people here, and they're not going to leave. They've been here too long, most of them over a decade. What do we do with them instead? Instead of telling them to leave, which they're not going to do, what can we do to get them to come forward and identify themselves? Uh, and, and, and the answer is they have to undergo a background check. They have to pay a fine for what they've done wrong. They have to wait more than, 11, than 10 years. Um, and they have to start paying taxes. It's, their legalization is not permanent. It is a renewable legalization. It expires in six years. So they have to go back and renew it where they have to prove that they're gainfully employed, that they're not a public charge. They don't qualify for any federal benefits, including Obamacare, no welfare, no food stamps. Uh, or the alternative is to leave it the way it is now. And the way it is now is terrible. It's just not good for anybody. The only people benefiting from the way it is now are the people that are trafficking them, bringing them across the border, or the people that are hiring uh, labor at the expense of the American worker because they can pay these guys less. You so, said something. You said something key a moment ago, and I, yep. I, I won't explore it. And you said that is the Democrats propose it. We can't just ignore it. We have to. We have to offer alternatives. Now I, you're you're a freshman in the Senate, so um, this this is a, not a comment directed at you. But yep. I have been just as a commentator and an observer. I've been amazed. Democrats propose anything, and we have to accept it. That becomes what becomes the, the, the news of the day, the item of the day. We somehow have to be in favor of it, but we're going to make alternatives. Why can't we just oppose something that they propose, such as Obamacare? Why did we have to offer alternatives? I know you weren't there then, but why do we yeah. have to offer alternatives to what they, they they are proposing things that we intrinsically disagree with? Why can't we just say no? Well, a couple things. We, we have opposed, for example, their infringement upon the Second Amendment. On the other hand, you know, our existing laws, we have people right now that are criminals. They're going in and trying to buy a gun. They fail the existing background check, and nobody prosecutes them. That's a problem. They should enforce that. And then we had an amendment that would force them to do that. We do have people that are mentally ill in this country that shouldn't be able, and everyone agrees with that, that that should be ways to, but also what about violence? No one's talking about violence. All this focus on what they're using to commit the violence, and no one's asking the fundamental question, why have we become a society that, where these acts of violence are happening so frequently? Of course, the answer is societal breakdown. And there's, you can't legislate that. I mean, there's things you can do to strengthen your society, but you can't force people to be better parents or believe in God or anything like that. True. Beyond that, I would say on the immigration front, we, you talk to the business community, you talk to people on our economic system. Uh, look, if I were to say to you today, and I know you're a big sports fan, so if I were to say to you today, you know, that, uh, you know, we, we wouldn't, if someone, is, uh, if someone can throw 99 mile an hour fastballs uh, in, into the strike zone consistently, you know we're going to bring them here. I mean, there's no way in the world we're not going to bring them. If someone is six foot eight and can, you know, dunk basketballs and never misses a 20 foot jump shot, you know we're going to keep them. But we're not doing that for science and technology. We're, we're, we're asking some of the. Yeah, but that's not, that's not, that's a whole different thing than what yeah. we're talking about with the illegal immigrants. We've got 30 
30 seconds, by the way. I want to give it to you to wrap up. Well, th that has to do with the immigration reform in terms of modernizing the system. Look, here's the bottom line. We're not going to deport 11 million people. The status quo is amnesty, and that's why we've come up with a process where these folks have to come forward, undergo a background check, pay a fine, start paying taxes, not qualify for federal benefits, and wait 11 years. And then the only thing they get is the chance to apply for a green card. They still have to qualify for it. I know it's not perfect, but it's a lot better than what we have right now. Senator Marco Rubio of Florida, really, as always, appreciate your time. No, Rush, thanks for Thank having me. Thank you for I your straightforwardness. You bet. I appreciate your straightforwardness. He's a straight shooter, and we'll be back right after this. Thank you.